This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome. We have with us this evening arguably one of the most influential economists in America. He's been an advisor to a number of American presidents, more than we can count, starting with Ronald Reagan, to whom he was the chief economic advisor. He's a key advisor to President Bush as well. We have with us Dr. Martin Feldstein. Thank you so much for being with us. Happy to be with you. At the start, let me start by asking you, am I speaking to the next head of the Federal Reserve? Well, the current head of the Federal Reserve is Alan Greenspan, and he has a, another year, uh, and he's doing a very good job. But there is talk, of course, of you being his possible oh, successor. I'm sure you've read those reports. There's a lot of talk about things, but right now there's no reason to really speculate on that. You said that he's doing a good job. Are you happy with the state of the American economy right now? Very much so. You know, people ask me, when is the economy going to start recovering? I don't understand the question. The economy has been recovering now for quite a long time. Last year we grew at 4%. The expectation is we'll continue to grow in the 35 to 4% range this year. So I would say the U.S. economy, measured by economic growth, is in quite good shape. And by employment, we've added more than 2 million jobs in the last year. So again, I would say the economy is doing very well. Right. I would like to take you up in some detail on the American economy, some of your own prescriptions for the American economy as well, such as tax cuts, uh, to take just one example. But before we do that, I just had to come to India a little bit. Now, you, of course, have had a close uh, association with India. Uh, would you just like to run us through that? Uh, you know, you, you've been coming up fairly frequently. Well, I've been coming here at least like uh, once a year, uh, bringing a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research in the U.S., uh, meeting with a group of people in this country, including uh, people from think tanks, from the government, from the press, uh, for a few-day meeting each this year. This is, of course, the Nimrana group. As exactly, it's the Nimrana group. Uh, so uh, I have uh, been fascinated by the changes that have been occurring and the progress that's been occurring in India. Right. And when do you, when these interactions have been taking place, are you also talking about greater, greater cooperation between the two countries, or is it largely looking at a prescriptive level at what's happening in India? No, we're looking both at the U.S. and at what is happening in India. So uh, not so much about the interaction between the two economies, but each of us learning a little more about each other's economy. Well, well, of course, I mean, the reason I'm asking that is that here in India, we'd love to know what one of the most influential uh, voices in the years of American presidents is actually saying about how American economic policy towards India should be structured. Would you like to do things any differently? Well, I think the key issue, of course, is trade. And uh, there was some talk over the past year during the campaign about cutting back on outsourcing and the like. Uh, President Bush was very, very strong in opposing that and saying that he favored a continued trade and continued ability of American firms to draw on, on um, outsourcing uh, here in India. So I think uh, growing that trade between the U.S. and India is very important. Of course, there's also a, a quite separate non-political cooperation uh, in the diplomatic and military area, and I think that's also important. So you, in other words, are also throwing your weight behind this entire concept that outsourcing is not something that can be stopped. It's part of free trade, and the U.S. has to just go on accepting the, the changing Well, it's more than business. just accepting. I think it is a positive thing for both of us. It's clearly positive for India. It's creating opportunities and jobs here. But for the U.S., it's a source of productivity improvements. So it would be foolish to try to stop it even if one could. And I think it, uh, that's not going to happen. I think we're going to see continued strong growth of that as more and more firms learn to take advantage of the opportunities for outsourcing. When you advise Indian economists and think tanks at these meetings that you were just talking about, what do you tell them? What is it, in your view, that India really needs to do right now? Oh, there's a long list of things, I'm afraid. Well, then uh, let's start. So let's start. Well, in terms of, of explicit, direct government policies, one of the things I worry most about is the size of the fiscal deficits. With the government at the central and state levels borrowing 10 percent of GDP, it's hard to get the right level of investment going. And without that kind of investment, it's hard to get some of the productivity gains. 
infrastructure, extremely important. Education, India benefits tremendously from the high quality of higher education, but if that pipeline isn't expanded, if more people aren't coming through primary and secondary schools, then this uh, higher education won't be able to expand rapidly enough to meet the needs of the industries that are growing. So I would put all of those very high on the agenda. Right. Um, I'm going to take each of those in turn and, and really take it through. Fiscal deficit, you said infrastructure and education. I think many people would agree with you that those are problems here. Now, when you say that the fiscal deficit is a big concern, how do you contrast that with your known position that tax cuts at the same time are something that should be done, at least in the United States? You're known to have quite frequently backed, supported, yeah, but it, for example, George Bush's tax right, cuts. Right, and I do support those tax cuts. Uh, right now, the fiscal deficit in the U.S., central government and state governments, uh, is about 4.5% uh, of GDP. So here, relative to India's GDP, it's more than twice that doesn't show any sign of coming down. In the U.S., the predictions are it'll come down to roughly 2, 2.5% two of GDP over the next half dozen years or so. So I think that the situations are really very, very different. Uh, and, and of course, our taxes are a much higher share of GDP. In the United States, about a third of GDP, while here it's less than half that. So I would put a great emphasis on bringing down the size of the fiscal deficit. But here, as I understand some of the spending, particularly at the state level, uh, there's a lot of room to reduce spending, particularly spending on subsidies, electricity uh, subsidies and the like, uh, so that it's not a matter of raising taxes in order to bring down the size of the fiscal so even deficit. Even in India, your prescription would be cut the fiscal deficit by cutting spending not by increasing taxation. To the extent that that's possible, I would certainly want to do that. Whether there's do you think also there's a case at all for cutting taxation in India, rationalizing them, bringing them down. I mean, in other words, your prescription for the United States. Well, it, would the, that work the here as well? tax structure here is very, very different, and and I don't regard myself as an expert on the Indian tax structure, but the overlapping taxes at the state and federal level uh, is a problem here, as I understand it. Uh, the lack of a uniform tax structure. So it's really a very different situation and it does seem to me that there is scope for simplifying, rationalizing, moving toward a more uniform tax structure in India that would uh, probably both produce more revenue and also at the same time less distortion and, and uh, do less harm to the Indian economy. But if I could just draw a parallel with the United States, if, if part of, your, of the case was saying that we need not worry too much about the fiscal deficit in America and that it is likely to come down, is based essentially on growth, that the economy will continue to grow at 2.83%. Now in India, you're having growth at 6, 6.5%. Right. So using that same logic, you could argue that fiscal deficit is not a reason to, you need not be concerned because growth will take care of it. But it won't. I mean, the Why arithmetic, the two well, because you're starting at a much higher level of the deficit. The debt to GDP ratio is growing rapidly. And so that ratio is going to continue to grow unless you can make some dent in the size of your fiscal deficit. Right. Now, the big problem, of course, which comes in that, and this is a big debate which is taking place in India, when you're talking about targeting spending and use that as a method for controlling fiscal deficit, People say you're really targeting the poor, or that's something which you need to do. It's a poor country. You have to give subsidies to them. Um, therefore, it's much easier to just have higher taxes. Again, I'm an, an outsider who's, uh, while a frequent visitor to India, I'm but not an Indian. Uh, but nevertheless, what I understand is that the people who are benefiting from some of the water subsidies and the electricity subsidies are not the poor, but the more affluent farmers, the more mechanized farms, and so on. Right. So that. Uh, it would be much better to charge for these things and then to use some of those proceeds to help the really poor. All right. We are continuing to really take examples from, from, from the American experience and use them to India. We just take a very quick break at this point.